The phenomenally creative musician and filmmaker David Byrne presents new artwork that explores daily life in surprising ways with unique reflections on shared human experiences. The book for our time from a highly influential artist, Friday has done a really beautiful job on this book, so we congratulate them as well. David Byrne's practice spans photography, performance, drawing, illustration, video design, and publishing. In 1975, he co-founded the seminal group Talking Heads. Byrne's exuberant and radical creativity has challenged classifications of art for decades. His Bicycle Diaries was a Los Angeles Times bestseller, and his How Music Works was a New York Times bestseller, as well as an Amazon Energy Pick and a Best Book of the Month. His Tony Award winning theatrical concert American Utopia was adapted by Spike Lee into a concert film that premiered on HBO and received multiple Emmys. And he is here tonight in conversation with Alex Kalman, who is a designer, editor, curator, journalist, and filmmaker. He is the founder of What Studio and Museum. So I'm going to hand over to you. Can we have a conversation? Yeah, we have 40 minutes to fill. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we're here because we made a book, which is this book. And you know that it's a book, right? Because there's a front cover and a back cover, and it's filled with pages. So in my world, that's a book. In your world, that's a book, David? Yeah, it is, yeah. Okay, so, so far, so good, we agree on that. Mm -hmm. um, this book is made of drawings that you were doing during the pandemic. How, did I show you some of these drawings or something? How did, how did, how did, Alex, uh, as I recall, Alex saw some of these drawings, asked to see more, and then kind of surprised, said, Here's, here's what a book might look like. <laughs> and I thought, this looks really <laughs> But how did you know about these drawings? Well, I think actually the first thing you said, when the first version I showed you, you said, mm, I'm not sure about that. That's OK. Uh -huh. uh, but I'm happy that you blocked that out of your memory. <laughs> <laughs> it makes, it makes, it makes it me more like, impressive. Yeah, it turned, it turned into a story of how wonderful. Yeah, but you, it's exactly, don't change the thing. I saw the I saw the drawings because um, I had gotten a hold of a copy of your house keys, and one day I went to your house. I convinced the doorman to let me in, and I went in, and I kind of found these drawings, and I thought this would make a great book, and then I thought if we ever make the book and we do an event, I should make sure not to tell David that how I saw the drawing. I'm sort of okay. half believing this. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of plausible. It, yeah, it's plausible, but that's not how it happened. Yeah, what happened was I wrote to you and said, we had made a book of the drawings, Myra's drawings from the curtain from your show, American Utopia, mm -hmm. and lyrics and text from the show. And it was fun to make, and I think we liked the book. And I wrote to you saying, perhaps it would be nice to make a book. Do you have any thoughts? And, and it was during the pandemic, so I think that, that for me, the kind of searching for something meaningful and interesting to work on is a way of kind of grounding myself. Uh -huh. and, and thinking about what are the possibilities. And you said, well, I've been working on these drawings. And here's a link did to I that folder. Yeah, did I send, I often attach drawings or photographs to emails that I send to people just as uh, as a way of, I don't know, uh, lightning conducting, <laughs> adding another layer of something. And uh, had I done that, or? I received emails from you with kind of uh, unrelated images that are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that there's a kind of a conversation happening, and then there's an image that has nothing to do with anything, but kind of in that it has everything to do with everything. So they're, they're great, but but no, you okay, didn't do so that. So somehow the drawings? Yeah, somehow the drawings okay. made their way to me, not, not through breaking an entry. Good. Okay. I don't. Is that comforting? Yeah, but a little bit. Okay. A little bit but I, I sort of buy, but I buy the breaking and entering too. Um, I, 
I'm not sure if I said it or you said it, but we came to an agreement that the drawings sort of fall into categories. Uh, yeah, we said it would be nice if we're going to make a book to find a way to for the drunks to tell a story. Mm -hmm. um, I agreed that I would write passages, the text, will throw things in between the chapters, if you want to call them chapters, and we, yeah. Um, wow. Is that, I seem to recall there wasn't a lot of haggling between us. It was kind of, once we got to that, it was kind of like, oh, I think we need some more drawings in this section. Yeah. Let me see if I have some more or I'll do some more. Yeah. We don't have enough in that, that chapter. Well, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of haggling between us in the process. There was a lot of haggling for me internally in the process oh. of just how to, what, what is the logic of these? what is the logic of the kind of flow or order of these drawings and they could be random or they could seem random or we could try to kind of tell this story so but it was it was a lot of fun for me to to kind of take lay out all the drawings on the floor and arrange them and rearrange them until kind of something started to feel like there was a story and I was trying to do you know some of the heavy lifting mm -hmm. and then but yeah once once we found it it was it kind of it was there yeah I realized in after I'd done a certain number of these drawings which I was doing for a, a kind of web magazine that I have called reason to be cheerful for a project that my colleagues there were doing and that they wanted uh, for this one project they wanted illust little illustrations so I said oh I'll do them I'll give you some dingbacks and the that you can I'll make you a library of things like that, and you can just draw from those they don't have to have anything specific to do with any I'm not going to illustrate every story but you can kind of use those and sprinkle those around uh, so once I got going it was yeah I just started drawing a few of them at least every day and I realized after a while looking at them after I accumulated a number, I realized, oh, these are about COVID. These are about being locked in, locked down, not being denied access to friends and family and that we can't go out and socialize and all the things that we all went through, uh, except for people in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I didn't know that when I started drawing them, but I realized in retrospect, this is what this is. And Alex and I realized, oh, and they fall into categories. Uh, there's all this, there's quite a number of drawings about body issues. And I realized, looking at them, I realized, oh yeah, well, we've just gone through two years of our bodies holding us captive. Um, but our bodies have, due to the, the uh, pandemic, we are whatever, the other part of ourselves has been kind of held at home by our bodies. And so we are naturally have issues about that. What it might be like, what is, yeah, what's my body about? How many eyeballs can I have? And why do we, yeah, all, all sorts of things. Dysmorphia, whatever, yes, all sorts of feelings about that. And yeah, so that became obvious. And then the, in the various chapters, and, and then fell into line eventually. Yeah. Um, in the book, you talk about drawing, in the intro to the book, you talk about drawing these during the pandemic and during lockdown. And this idea that we are assessing our priorities. Reassessing our priorities. Do you remember yes. that? Yes, as we were. Um, there were... I mean, I felt, and it's been written about a million times, that all these things happened during the pandemic. These things that were kind of, had the lid on them, all just came out. Black Lives Matter, people feeling like, I don't really love my job. Why do I need to keep doing this? Uh, all that stuff 
kept happening in people talking about things that they hadn't really, they'd been kind of thinking about but hadn't talked about. And yeah, so it was kind of a major thing where people were reassessing all sorts of aspects of their lives, not just, oh, why can't I go out to a yeah. music club? And among the people reassessing, were you reassessing? <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us thought, what really matters to me now? Am I going to kind of just go on and do things the way I did, always did? I think not. I think everybody, to some extent, felt like, you know, I'm going to ask myself some questions before about the rest of my life and think about, you know, what is it that really matters to me? That may, puts a lot of weight on this little book of drawings, but uh, in, it's kind of in there. Yeah, I mean, it's a little book and it's a big book at the same time. And it's uh, it's deceptive in that way, which I think is, you know, wonderful that uh, you can you can be uh, serious without being didactic and without being heavy handed and without going on forever. Um, are there things that you've reassessed for yourself about what really matters to you? Wow. Uh, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, if you want a way out of that question, I was, out. yeah, without answering it. <laughs> it was getting too, kind of, we're getting too far into the uh, therapist's office. You can say, okay, the session's over. I was going to hand you a piece of paper in the very beginning of this and say, if there's any questions you don't want me to ask you, write them down this piece of paper so they don't know, and I know not to ask. But in the excitement of the moment, yeah, so here we are. Wow. Um, It'll come to me. There, there's, I think there's a lot of things that now I'm start, I, like a lot of us, I think, we've kind of incorporated it in, into our lives, things that we think, should I do this, should I do this? And we go, nah, I, I really, you know, I really don't like that. I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to waste my time, my life doing things I don't want to do. We, we don't all have that luxury. Probably none of us have that luxury, but we kind of think about it now. Do you think that your thoughts about time have changed? Or what are your thoughts on time? Do you, do you think about time? Do you have feelings about time? Um, I, I, I've tried reading some of the Carlo Rovelli books. Where he talks about time, uh -huh. time not the, or time not existing, or time being a, tied up with space and you know, all those sort of things. Bendable. Bendable, all these kinds of things. And I was doing pretty good until I got two thirds of the way through. <laughs> I kind of went, whoa! <laughs> now my mind is completely bent out of shape, and I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> so it's just I'll a, try it again. I'll come yeah, I'll you just need a little time, and then you can time. return to it. He's a great writer. Um, well, those are all my questions. <laughs> okay, what are you working on now? Uh, art articulating a sentence. <laughs> 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 some book projects, some exhibition projects. Some film stuff, you know, a, a mix of things. Alex Usual. has a, a wonderful, he's a one of co creators, should I say, of a wonderful uh, museum downtown, not as far downtown as this. <laughs> um, it's called Museum with extra an extra M at the beginning and the end. Um, it's maybe the smallest museum in the world, it's in an elevator shaft in Portland Alley. And they have shows that more than like sometimes four shows running simultaneously in the elevator shaft. <laughs> no surprise, the objects in the shows are not that big. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really good. I recommend it's not back it's not reopened yet, but it's 
I, when, when it does, it's, it's really uh, an amazing thing. Thank you. I have a question for you. What do you think of the concept advertising should be illegal? I wondered about that the other day. Um, I think more and more we're aware that advertising is basically a form of manipulation. It's trying to get us to part with money and buy something, in many cases, something we don't actually need. Um, so in that, in that sense, it's an insidious force. In the other sense, if you look at it the other way, it's telling you, if you want washing up powder, if you want uh, milk, this is where you get it. But mother, <laughs> most of the time we know if you want milk, you go to the grocery store. And it doesn't, you don't, I don't know about most of you, but I'm not that picky about what brand I get. Uh, yeah. Wow, Here, so much money is spent on advertising too. It's a, I mean, you know, Google and Facebook and all that, YouTube and everything. I mean, the amount of money that is, that is generated pretty much entirely by, 90% of the money in Twitter is all advertising money. Right. And you just go, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money going to trying to get us to do things or buy things or convince us of stuff. You know, somebody told me that, and this needs to be fact-checked, but that if you're in a city, the visual landscape of the eye level space, kind of where your eyes are at and where you're standing, 70% is taken up with visual information mm -hmm. that is trying to kind of get your attention and a lot of it being advertising. Do you feel, do you ever feel kind of overwhelmed by the amount of information or noise or yeah, visual? Yeah. Sometimes if I'm, I'm traveling, occasionally I have, a, I have the opportunity to travel and you go, you're at some place where there, there aren't, there isn't advertising everywhere, non-stop non -stop horizon, and you come back and you realize, whoa, whoa, this is really overwhelming. Right. Um, that said, um, there are certain aspects of that world that I find Kind of perversely enjoyable. Um, some years ago, I discovered the world of these things. I don't think they even exist anymore. Called industrials, which is these uh, kind of theatrical events. Now you, we're all familiar with like the Apple events or the these you know big presentations of that. Well, these are uh, events that companies hold for all their own salespeople and employees and everything like that. And they would do in these incredible productions, uh, like General Motors or uh, whatever, all these different companies. They would write a whole musical. They would hire great lyricists and composers and do these full on productions about the latest line of cars or whatever, the Betty Crocker or whatever it might be. Um, I thought, this is on this invisible art form. Obviously, it's trying to sell something, but it's kind of amazing that here's this creative art form that's kind of invisible to us, to most of us. I don't know where that's going now. That's okay. I don't know where I'm <laughs> not leaving us. Um, back to the book a little bit and to the act of drawing. Does drawing help you cope with this thing called life? That yeah, you're yeah. yeah, a lot. Oh, yeah, a lot. Um, as I said, I had no idea of, that I was whatever self analyzing or doing whatever it might be when I was doing these drawings, but obviously they just poured out. And after a while, I realized, oh, 
I got some I got some issues here <laughs> and it's all coming out and there they are and thank goodness some of them are funny uh, <laughs> uh, I was I was not able to write any songs which is kind of my normal day job in a way I was not able to do that during the pandemic I thought how do I write about this um, right you were you were you weren't of you were actually trying to a little bit or you were experimenting with writing and you were realizing that you couldn't write rather than just you knew that you weren't even going to try writing. I tried I tried I, I wrote a song about um, I wrote a song about being attracted to someone but all you could see was their eyes and, their eyes. <laughs> and, but you, and you could tell that they had Pharrell in their purse <laughs> you could never you couldn't get any closer than six feet so it was kind of doomed from the start <laughs> It, but, I, and I, but what so was it I did, about I did, it? And I got it to I got it to rhyme, and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it and I thought, this thing is not a fucking joke. You know, this is right. this is what's happening is real. People are dying. I shouldn't. I don't know if it's right for me to write a funny song about it. Right, and the mind was consumed by survival and COVID, so there weren't you weren't thinking of writing songs about. Yeah, other, other things, yeah, other kind of, themes. It was, it was so was over the weight of all the social and other things that were going on. Yeah, at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Did you draw as a? Well, we all kind of draw as children, but was art something that was in your home as a child? Was it part of the household? Did your parents have a relationship to art? Uh, my, my parents, um, yes, a little bit. I remember there was a, a kind of reproduction of a Cubist Picasso thing um, that was hanging in the house and I came in kind of like Wait, what what's this stuff here? Is there there's musicians in there, right? There's somebody playing like a oboe and somebody with a guitar, really? And it was it was kind of like a puzzle to try and figure out. At least at that age that's that's what I was that's how I took it. What age was that around? Yeah, you know, like, was it eight or something like you know, a child. My my father who was an engineer electronics and but he was also a painter who kind of painted kind of in the style of Matisse or something like that uh really you know I thought wow he does this other stuff um he did funny things too um if he found a, a frame he would saw off part of the picture to fit the frame. <laughs> Wait. Even, just even a frame at that age, away. I thought, there's something backwards. <laughs> that's the engineering him. Yeah, that's the engineering him. That's the making yes. fit. Problem, making it work. Problem solving. Right. Saw off part of the picture. <laughs> Do you think it mattered to him what part of the picture it was, or just as long as it fit? I should hope so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I should hope so. I mean, sometimes we do pictures of me and my sister and I thought, please don't talk, you know, <laughs> please don't cut me out of the picture. You know? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I don't know about you, but yes, and then as a high school student, yes, I started drawing a lot, I do cartoons, and I'm old enough that I, I wanted to draw psychedelic things, mm -hmm. so I would just like, I was not doing drugs, but I would just be in the basement with paints and draw these like mandala shapes and, and all these colors. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. How about you? Art, yeah, art was in the home for me. Mm -hmm. you know, my mother is an artist, and my father was a designer, so mm -hmm. there was always this kind of that was part of the vocabulary of you know rather than having a conversation after dinner of how was your day and what did you learn in school and you know there was we kind of avoided all of that 
and it would just be okay you know time to make a book or time to kind of make something together wow. so that was liberating and, mm -hmm. and wonderful and never having to kind of explain well I had to explain myself sometimes mm -hmm. um, but but yeah the, the commons lived across the street from me uh, at that time so we kind of would cross paths a lot um, yeah yeah I have a memory of one Halloween coming by and I think there was kind of I remember thinking that there was something happening at your place but I might have been wrong but I think that you were there perhaps in a kind of a, a strange clown yeah that's true costume. that's true yeah that's yeah, not from a nightmare I do the full clown thing one year and Oh, it scarred, it scarred the children in the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty scary. Um, pretty scary. Some friends came over. Yeah. And one friend, you know, was sitting right next to me and and then asked my wife at the time, so who, who's the clown guy? <laughs> <laughs> it was that. That's scary. Yeah, it was, it, you were committed <laughs> yeah. to that. Yes. Uh, but yeah, so drawing became like this way of freaking way of kind of uh, expressing how you dialogue with yourself. Uh, and it, yeah, I think it's not that hard to do. And I think um, I went to art, art school, and there were always debates about, oh, why are we learning to draw? Drawing is, you know, like an old, uh, it's outdated. You can make art with all sorts of materials now, which is all true. But it's also kind of a way of thinking with kind of with your hands. So you learn to draw. I mean you drew during your life and then you you learn to draw in school. I resisted, like probably a lot of others. Um, you know, the art school I went to had life drawing class and uh -huh. drawings, you know bowls of fruit and all that kind of stuff but I just said what this is completely what does this have to do with my life really <laughs> and so I would do kind of fanciful interpretations of it but still some of it sunk in some of it sunk in and now that things are starting to we're becoming a little bit more active again and going out and doing things and more than we were during the lockdown are you still drawing yes i am good yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I did something the other day and i'm wondering you know, mm, where do i take that what do i do with it right do you know what time it is <laughs> seven thirty it's uh it's seven thirty it says here is that right yeah Yes, should we so open it up? We can, we can do questions, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, my question is, um, this book is very much about people being apart, and your show American Utopia is very much about people coming together. Um, so I'm wondering if making these drawings and making this, this book kind of affected the way you thought about coming together and bringing your show American Utopia back to um, the stage kind of after the lockdown. Yes, so uh, before the pandemic, I was doing a show on, on, on Broadway. There was an extension of a tour, and uh, I part of the show, I did these little talking segments. And as part of the talking segments, it was kind of about how we relate to one another as people. And how, uh, well, I say it at the end, that who we are, our identities, is partly in ourselves, but it's also partly in how we it made by all our relationships and connections with all the people around us. We're not isolated as things. And then the pandemic hit and boom. We kind of were, kind of were isolated. And so that was a thing that 
to deal with. And when we came back on Broadway, I kind of had to felt like I'm gonna, I gotta acknowledge this. I gotta acknowledge a little bit of what happened and what that felt like and what being connected with people actually means. Um, I'm someone someone who, at a younger age, was very socially awkward, and gradually, little by little, became more and more comfortable uh, talking with talking with people uh, in a kind of intimate setting. Um, I never had a problem performing because that felt oh, felt like an artificial construct, but actually, like sitting at say a dinner table and talking with people. That was tough, uh, but gradually that kind of changed, and so I kind of had a little perspective on on what that meant and what it means to people. That was a long answer to your one question. More questions? Yes. So this is kind of a big thing, but uh, you alluded to your sort of starting to draw and looking back and saying like, "Oh, this is something I didn't realize it was." And so both across the pandemic and sort of across your entire creative span, how have you found that relationship with the, the creation of art changing for yourself? Uh, can you say your relationship to creating art, essentially. How has that changed? Oh, how has that changed? I don't know if it's changed, but I've, having done for my whole life, I start to realize, oh, this is what I'm doing. You don't have to know what you're doing when you start. You can just push things around and draw things or make music and you have no idea where it's going. And then you it'll kind of reveal itself what what it what it wants to be and then you have to listen and let it be where it wants to be. And I've kind of learned that that's part of the process. But I I didn't go in with that kind of intention. Now, mm. what do you do when you're working on something, designing something? Do, is there a lot of dead ends? I well, yeah. You try to kind of avoid the dead ends and and find what the path forward is. But I think that there's a lot of uh, not trying to control, having that balance between controlling something and also listening to it and letting it kind of speak to you and direct you a bit and if you can not if you can find the kind of balance of not being too one or the other not trying to force it into something that it can't be and also not trying to kind of let it run away from you um but strike that kind of delicate balance that's i find for me that kind of the yields the the most kind of meaningful mm -hmm. results or the, the results that I feel are most kind of exciting. Yes. Uh, I was wondering how you decided on the title of History of the World. It's uh, very grabbing. Ah. Well, now it's came up with it. Yeah, we realized that that's kind of, you know, knowing that there is no singular history of the world that um that this is a kind of you know unusual visual telling of that and it's both this kind of looking at uh looking at ourselves through time and through kind of processing something as well as a very simple literal you know we're gonna we're gonna start in these drawings that are kind of craggier and more in the, the natural landscape and kind of more of an explosion of a moment and, and the emergence of things and then move through time until we're kind of in this uh, modern, more modern era and then things get a little bit strange and wayward and, and, and uh, kind of start to go a little bit uh, bonkers and then we kind of come out with some, with some uh, potential lessons learned and, and, and things to kind of think about as we move, continue moving forward through time. Uh, when Alex proposed this title, I thought, I, I think we may have 
going back and forth about one word in the title or something, but in general, I love that it was so kind of preposterous and pretentious, <laughs> and yet somehow it undercut that by being in being bad. <laughs> in life. Yeah, and so it was kind of this kind of way, like, this is a book that is kind of dealing with a lot of stuff, but it's also, don't worry. Yeah. And, you know, also in the in the design and the aesthetic of it, you know, it's, it's obviously, it's this idea of kind of being, uh, thinking for a moment that it might be authoritative, but then it also being this kind of, you know, wink that, David is, you know, referring to that kind of undercuts it. And so using this, you know, the the red, you know, linen and the gold debossed text, it's, you know, it's it's playing with this kind of tradition of like the encyclopedia of life. Um, but it's also it's also, you know, a bit absurd and on the back there's a strange creature holding, I believe a iPhone, yeah, which is you know, fantastic. So, the folks at at Biden, the people who published it, they had some input as well. Um, I don't know about you, but I wasn't quite sure. Like, should this be like a nice big art book or what? And uh, this might sound a little crass, but they they said. If you make it less than, you know, under a certain size, there's a, there's a good chance that the bookstores will put it near the register. <laughs> <laughs> and they're kind of right. <laughs> and being what it is, my only concern was, I don't want the drawings to get shrunk, shrunken they weren't drawn giant, but I didn't want them to be reduced in size where they looked like they couldn't have been drawn by hand. Like they were some like a shrunken reproduction, which they don't. But that was my only concern about the size. But the other than that, I thought, no, 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 this is, it's fine. And it, it takes away some of the pretension and weight of having it look like a, a self-important art book. And it, also, it's easier to hold, <laughs> which is a nice thing to do with the book. Yeah, you can fit it in a bag. Yeah. yeah. Or, and yeah, you don't have to have a special stand for it. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to build a new wing to your apartment for it. And if you have big hands, you can hold it. And if you have small hands, you can hold it. Yes. Um. So I went to the Pace Gallery and uh, where I saw some of the pictures in the book as well as the big uh, tree murals with the roots. And I was wondering if that mural had any connection to the rest of the drawings or if it sort of had any of the answers to the, the questions that they were asked. I don't know if you can hear this man. No, he's asking about, uh, there was an exhibition I did of some of these drawings and some others and, and part of it was a a large tree drawing. It was a drawing of a tree, but then it was more like an evolutionary tree with different things in the roots and different things in the branches, as if the things in the roots uh, would have evolved into the things into, in the branches. And you no, know, I did those some years ago, and I did a whole book of, I went crazy doing a book of these kind of diagrams, uh, Venn diagrams and tree diagrams, and graphs and all this kind of stuff but all they're all kind of fanciful and all pushing that kind of stuff to a place where it kind of got absurd but in in pushing it to something that was absurd sometimes when I was lucky I got to a kind of deeper connection uh, I got this a connection between uh, whatever philosophy and the shapes of clouds, or whatever it might be, and the classifications of all these kinds of things, because as, I don't know, as humans, we seem to love to classify things, and a lot of that is kind of absurd, but I kind of found a beauty in that, too. Yes? Um, 
I am curious about your approach to mediums, like choosing a medium for an idea, and if like an idea comes and then you decide what medium, or if you want to explore a medium and then you think of what, how to explore it, or if that, yeah, plays a role. I mean, for me, I think that the uh, the idea pretty quickly kind of indicates what medium it wants to be, and of course you can kind of say, well, what if it was a this or what if it was a that? Or this is something that you should sit down with and kind of need to go on and you need to absorb it over time and it's a, it's a film. Um, sometimes one thing can also exist in, you know, multiple mediums too, which is also wonderful, seeing how something kind of changes form or when you adapt it. You know, with the little museum downtown, a big part of it is about saying, was a, was a kind of response to working in the digital space and to say, oh, it would be wonderful to create an actual space that people actually come to and step inside and they're there and there's something there on the shelf that's also real. And then there's kind of, you know, a kind of game of ping pong that happens between that thing and the person who's looking at it. But then we've also been adapting those stories, those kind of collections into visual stories for uh, uh, newspapers. And so then you're kind of moving it into the 2D space. And so I think that there's, a, there's something wonderful about saying what happens when you take an idea and kind of translate it into different mediums. And you learn a lot that way too, of kind of what you love about a certain medium or what the shortcoming is of, a, of another medium. Um, but so for me, I think, you know, unless there's kind of that trans Latory process, uh, the medium and the idea kind of come together. It's not so much, I think, a chicken and egg. I, I think um, one of the things that got bashed into my head when I was at art school was that you, that you had to, the medium had to be true to the whatever it is you were saying or whatever it is you were trying to express. Of course, you can kind of stretch that quite a bit. But one of the nice things about a, a little book of drawing is the, the cumulative effect. It's one thing like if somebody, God bless the art gallery, that they had this show and sold some things, but then somebody's going to have one drawing at home that I think you get a really different effect from looking through, you know, a hundred some. It's like a, in a book of photographs, you have this cumulative effect of looking through lots of them. I know from uh, like the Kafka short stories, some of them are just a page and a half long, but you read through about a dozen of them and it starts to really have a bigger effect. And then there's also the, always the notion of what can you, which I think you're kind of speaking to a little bit, what can you do in this medium that you can't do in any other mm -hmm. medium? So like, you know, why this, like, why isn't this another medium? And, and how are you embracing this medium and doing something with it that can only be done in this particular medium? It's almost time, but yeah. Uh, do you guys have a favorite drawing from the book? Favorite? I mean. <laughs> it's not, it's okay. It's the <laughs> one that we put on the back cover is one of my favorite drawings. <laughs> the sort of bird creature with holding the phone. <laughs> Are there any other questions before we have to wrap it up? Okay. Oh, yes. Um, so earlier, um, you guys mentioned that with the pandemic, there are also some social movements going on such as Black Lives Matter that were obviously being acknowledged um, and on the rise after a long period of stall. I was wondering if, for you both, how that type of acknowledgement to that movement changed the way you perceive art as well as the way you create art with others. It certainly, well, b before the pandemic, before the marches and everything, I had already decided that 
Mm-hmm. I wasn't sure about art being a kind of a, a force for changing people's minds, but I felt like it had to reflect the world we live in. And I started to change the kind of my, my performance, my concerts, my things, and I thought, I need to acknowledge the world we live in, uh, for better or worse, and not pretend like, oh, when you come to the show, you're stepping away from the world. You're still in the world. You, you, it's inter- entertaining and everybody feels great, but I want to still remind people we're living in this world. And some of that makes its way into the book. I think that's a nice point to end on. Okay. Thank you all.